Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I forewarn you, I speak as a sort of economist rather than an international relations person or, or uh, <coughs> politics, and I think they have rather different takes on China and Africa. Uh, and my first point is addressed to the ESRC and differed, better late than never. In 2005, Sussex, uh, Manchester, and East Anglia put together a large program of research on China and Africa. And it's in the nature of the ESRC that it doesn't do anything outside of the average or current knowledge. And they sniffed at that and they thought there wasn't really an issue worth considering and uh, let it fly. And that speaks for itself. Uh, but it's, it's great to see now the recognition that we are witnessing significant developments now in the changing center of gravity of the global economy and global politics and the uh, way in which China's participating in Africa is an exemplar of some significance uh, of what are much wider global trends. I'm going to speak about three phases, excuse me, what I call the early years of our awareness on China and Africa, which is, say, pre-2008-2009. And then I want to talk about the insights from research from about 2008 and 2009 until now. And then I'll briefly say a few words about the future, which are complementary to rather than competitive with the agenda which Clifford has mapped out. So the early years uh, were years of uh, uninformation, misinformation, and disinformation. And a, a couple of anecdotes. Uh, in 2005, I went to the African Economic Research Consortium, the largest group of African economists working together. Uh, I'm a South African, and I sat down with uh, Olu and, uh, uh, and Adamola, both very prominent in the AERC, and they said, you're a South African. It's your footprint we're thinking about. We're not thinking about the Chinese footprint at all. And when we first started working with the AERC, I have a graphic memory of one of the African elite, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, saying Chinese radios are rubbish. You know, you buy them, they may cost $5, but they only last eight months. I prefer a really good Japanese radio. Chinese products just aren't good enough quality for Africa. Uh, I also, and you will all know the accusations when we first started that Chinese use prison labor uh, living in camps, uh, a story which Deborah Brodigan has debunked, but certainly it was a key attitudinal view which influenced the way we thought about China in that early period. Uh, and the third anecdote was a meeting we had at the IDS in Nairobi where one of the African colleagues said, the problem is that China has a policy for Africa and Africa doesn't have a policy for China. And in these three anecdotes is a combination of the fact that we didn't know what was happening, what we thought we knew was wrong, and there were people who consciously disinformed us for ideological or political reasons. That early phase was also influenced by the story of the policeman who finds a drunk man under a lamppost on his knees, and he says to the drunk man, what are you doing? He says, I've lost my keys and I'm looking for it. The policeman says, let me help you. And after half an hour, the policeman says, look, just give me a bit more detail on where your keys are. And the man said, oh, the keys, oh, I left them, I lost them somewhere over that hill over there. The policeman said, well, why are we looking here? He said, oh, there's a street light here and we can see what's happening. <laughs> and why that's relevant is that an awful lot of this early work in Africa, uh, China and Africa, was determined by the aggregates which were presented of a measurable indicator. Some of them were reasonably accurate, like trade, although China's trade with Tanzania and timber was 10 times greater as China's recorded imports than Tanzania's recording of exports, and as you will know, the information on aid and FDI is even more ropey than that. One of the first things I think we did was to uh, develop a framework, a taxonomy for thinking about China and Africa, and on that first column you can see a number of vectors with which China and Africa interacted. We came to understand that sometimes those interactions were complementary to African interests, and in other cases they were competitive, and more importantly, in some cases, these uh, 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 impacts had a, a direct nature. They were bilateral links between individual African countries and China. And yet, in fact, the impact of China on Africa, in inverted commas, I'll come back later on, is much more significant for the indirect impacts than for the direct impacts. Uh, 
It's China's growing footprint in the world and the way in which this has changed a whole series of global relationships, the price of commodities, global political governance, uh, the conception of aid. The indirect impacts have been much greater than the direct impacts, although most of our attention and most of the attention of researchers remains in this direct bilateral relationships between China and Africa. And if I would have any plea, it is with the, uh, the, the ESRC program to the research community, is don't focus on the measurables only and don't focus only on the direct impacts. The indirect and the unmeasurable impacts are both extremely important. Now, I'm running out of time, so I just want to go through a, a few things we've found. Uh, the first one is uh, that resources are an important part of the story. And most of us think about China's impact as resource-driven. In fact, that is not the case. The research which has been undertaken in a number of fronts, including a really interesting recent World Bank study on Ethiopia, is that China's presence in Africa is predominantly driven by the search for markets. That's not to say that resources aren't part of the story, but most, although the, the dominant part of China's presence in Africa is market driven. Secondly, in the case of the very large state-owned enterprises and infrastructural projects, there's a distinct character to China's presence, whereas Western uh, participation has distinguished foreign investment from aid, from trade, and tried to break the links between foreign investment and aid and trade. In the case of China's state-owned firms, the large firms in infrastructure projects, or in the case of the mines in, in the DRC, essentially the Chinese are gone with the bundle. And it's very difficult to distinguish what is aid, what is FDI, and many of the investments in the commodity sector are associated with complementary investments in education, roads, training, health, and a variety of other things. And there is a distinctive character in these large infrastructural investments of a bundling and a rejection of the, of the Western consensus on what constitutes acceptable ways to relate to uh, Africa and other developing countries. <coughs> Thirdly, uh, there's very little evidence that China is using Africa as a low-cost base in order to export to the world. This is a really important point because many people are saying, hopefully, as wage costs rise in China, so we can anticipate that Africa with its wage costs, and many countries in Africa have lower wage costs than China, wage rates, uh, uh, that production will shift to Africa uh, by Chinese firms to penetrate mm -hmm. local markets. Now, there are isolated pockets where this occurs. It occurs in the case of the garments and textile industry and to some extent the shoe industry, but there's no evidence that this is a substantial phenomenon. Um, the next one is uh, the question of uh, what is China? And this is a really important point because and I think uh, there have been a couple of studies done, uh, including by the IDS and others, which uh, breaks open the idea of China. We speak about China. China has an, a policy for Africa, but what are you talking about? If you take foreign investment, you've got central state-owned uh, firms, you've got provincial state-owned firms, you've got firms incorporated in China shifting to Africa because of intense competition in, Afri in China, and then you've got these millions, and I mean millions, of migrants who are there in Africa and an important source of entrepreneurial activity. So it may, uh, and when the research shows that while the state-owned firms have access to Chinese government support and the bundling and China has a policy for Africa, the independent Chinese firms and the migrants say, we never hear from our embassies. They don't care about us. We hear quite independently and are largely below the radar. So we have to break open what we mean by China and analogously, incidentally, break up what we mean by Africa because these are not homogeneous characters, and we have to be much more complex about the story. Now, my colleagues in Nigeria, I don't know whether Ben Lampert's here. Ben has worked in Nigeria for many years. He used to walk around the slums of Lagos, and they referred to him in Yoruba as the white person. He's now referred to as the Chinese person, because all foreigners who have light skins are, of course, Chinese. And when my colleague Giles Mohan has done work in Ghana, uh, and people have spoken about Chinese workers in, Ghana, in Chinese firms, they turn out not to be Chinese workers, but Pakistani drivers and Pakistani bricklayers. So 
we have to be very careful because China is not a unique new presence in Africa. This is the point I'm trying to make. China is the largest and most visible of a series of rising powers who are new entrants to this game and are having an important impact on Africa. So China's there, of course, but China's not the only rising power. I don't have time to talk about the distinctiveness of Chinese and Indian firms. We've done some research on that. Uh, and I'll leave it. Now, the last point I want to make, Dirk, about, and then I'll summarize, about what we've learned from research is this terrible phrase, the impact of China on Africa. Again, my colleagues Giles Mohan and Ben Lampert have worked in Nigeria, and they found a large number of, uh, of uh, Chinese firms employing Chinese labor. You know what? They found some African firms employing Chinese labor as well. And we have this old neo-colonial attitude, which it reflects, for those who have been in development studies many years, the dependency discussion, which sees Africa as being on its back, being raped by external sources, where Africans have no agency and are not part of that story. And that is absolutely not the case, particularly in the context of the dynamism of West African economies and the dynamism of, of Kenya and other East African economies. This relationship between different parts of Africa and different parts of China is being driven as much by Africans as it is by Chinese. So if I could pass on another insight from our research, which is please, please don't talk about the impact of China and Africa. We have two regions of the economy which are growing very, very rapidly indeed. They have their own internal dynamics. They're complex. They've got their own classes. They've got their own fractions of capital, if you want to use that word, different types of capital, uh, capitalists. They have complex states and not homogeneous states. And if we're to understand the role of China in Africa, we have to dispense with this uh, attitude which reflects dependency theory. Anyway, I don't have the time to go on. Let me say some words about the future, if I can. <laughs> Firstly, uh, we have to, I go back to the indirect consequences. We are witnessing momentous changes in global political economy. In 1969, India and China together accounted for 6.9% of global GDP. Until 1820, if you believe Angus Madison's figures, India and China together accounted for between 50 and 60 or more percent of the global uh, output. And by 2030, it will be 30 percent, and not long after again, these two giant Asian economies are going to drive the global economy. At the same time, we have a dynamism in Africa, the African lion, which has its own momentum. So, and we see the decline of Europe moving into stasis, the US retreating into itself for a variety of reasons, of which energy is also important. So we have to situate this evolving relationship between China and Africa in the context of a historically significant change in the momentum and trajectory of global growth and politics. Next point. How long will China continue with its policy of non-conditionality and not getting involved in, in uh, African uh, governance. Uh, it suited it to do this in the early years because it gave it a distinct competence and a distinct unique selling point compared to the Western firms. Chinese would work with anybody. But as China becomes, oh, sorry, as Chinese interests become more entrenched in Africa, so the quality of governance matters. So it matters whether workers are kidnapped or whether there's stability or whether the exchange rate will stay the same. Many of the things which drove Western relationships in Africa are soon going to impinge upon Chinese relationships in Africa as Chinese actors become more embedded in the African context. Now, number three, China's made this heavy investment in special economic zones. I think there are seven which are there in principle, of which three or four are operating. Do you think the northern countries didn't try industrial development for special economic zones in the past? Of course they did. And the question is, is this a realistic assumption that somehow there's something about these special economic zones which will make them distinctively different and a greater dynamic factor in African industrialization in the past? That's an open question. The Zambian special economic zone, I believe, has a single enterprise uh, operating, although it's extremely large. On the other hand, there are a series of private special economic zones, not the five or seven linked by the government, and you'll find that in a paper by Shen from the World Bank, really interesting, where Chinese firms have gone in and brought their suppliers with them, 
And you might argue that this is distinctively different from Western support for industrial development. I leave that as an open question. Dirk, you're concerned. I have two more points. Now, as I've said, China's uh, participation in Africa, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Chinese actors' participation in Africa, because they varied, is predominantly a market-driven, it's a market-seeking presence. It is also, in the case of oil and some commodities, and perhaps in agriculture, also a resource-seeking present. It is not an efficiency-seeking present. I'm talking about classical FDI theory. Is foreign investment market-seeking, <coughs> resource-seeking, or cost-minimizing? There doesn't appear to be, as I've argued before, evidence of China using Africa as a low-cost resource base. Might this change in the future and over what period of time? Finally, a hobby horse of my own. We look at above-the-radar things. We look at foreign investment. We look at state-owned enterprises. And we don't really take account of the things which are happening below the market. I've got three PhD students finishing their PhDs in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Each of them are looking at the use of Chinese and Indian uh, capital goods in Tanzania, tractors, in Kenya, it's furniture equipment, and uh, in Uganda, it's uh, garments. Uh, and what they find is that in technical terms, the Chinese equipment, which is being imported into those countries, remember China has such a range of competences that no doubt there's also Chinese equipment which is of a different nature. But the Chinese equipment which is being used in these countries is technically inefficient and quote unquote unprofitable compared to the use of Western technologies if Western technologies could be used at their design capacity. Two points. Firstly, small scale production hardly ever uses equipment at its design capacity. But secondly, for poor people, Chinese technologies represents an entry point. They're aware of the inefficiency of Chinese technology or the technology which is currently coming from China. They say, we know that, and we expect to graduate into this equipment in the future, but this is the only way. It's a form of primitive capitalist accumulation. And the point I'm trying to make is that there's this unseen political economy process which is happening on the ground of entrepreneurship coming from Chinese people who may or may not be legally registered, who may or may not be formally incorporated as firms, melding together with, an, excuse me, also small-scale Chinese and Indian firms exporting technologies to Africa, which somehow find a close fit. They're appropriate technologies for poor people in Africa. And I believe that this dynamism, this particular nature of this relationship, has important implications not just for growth in Africa, but also for equity, because it provides an entry point to the emergence of small-scale capital. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Rafi, and for laying out this, uh, this sort of economic framework to, uh, to, to examine the uh, impact of Chinese actors on different African uh, countries. Um, and um, uh, let's now turn to the, uh, the other economists on the, on the panel. And we've got two economists and two political scientists on the panel.